Okay, uh, this celebration of QCD, there was a, a variant of it in Stockholm last summer, in, uh, in June. And uh, we had a lot of the same speakers, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, we got to where, whoops, I'm hitting the wrong button. Uh, oh, there's the laser, all right. Uh, some of them are here, we got, I gotta get used to this. Uh, same people, those gold discs are actually chocolate candies, which is <laughs> kind of fun. And so you'll see these people here, uh, except Tuft won't be here. All right, so, it's a different thing here than there, okay. Uh, QCD is this amazing theory. It's really quite remarkable. It's a renormalizable quantum field theory which describes many of our particles, the protons, the neutrons, uh, the pions, et cetera. And let me, oh, I can look at that one. Ah, that's better, yes. Ah, I got the pointer. Okay. Uh, Oops, I've slipped up over the slide. Uh, what's remarkable about this theory is that it really doesn't have very many parameters. The only parameters are the masses of the quarks, so it's not zero, and we don't understand where they come from. But things like the strong coupling constant are not really a parameter. What you do is you put in a cutoff in your theory, and I'll go into this in more detail, get some physical particle right, like the proton. And if you get the proton mass right, then you just remove your cutoff holding that fixed. And the only thing left over are the quark masses. So that's a, a, an amazing thing. But there are a lot of things about QCD that we can't see with Feynman diagrams. First of all, is there's this confinement phenomenon that <coughs> free quarks don't exist, and there's gonna be a lot of talk about that by the various speakers. <clears throat> Another one is the way masses are generated. The proton mass is proportional to this parameter called lambda QCD, and you can't get that out of perturbation theory. Chiral symmetry breaking, the pion is much lighter than the rho, although they're made of exactly the same quarks. And we understand that from chiral symmetry breaking, which is really a non-perturbative phenomenon. And then there's an interesting point. I said there are no parameters but the quark masses. Well, there is one more, and actually it should be mapped in with the quark masses. That's this parameter called theta. Uh, and because of it, different theories can be identical in perturbation theory, and yet they have different physics. And I will also go into that with some detail. Now, the crucial tool for a lot of this stuff is uh, the path integrals, which go way back to Feynman many, many years ago. Uh, and the idea, let's try it, I gotta get this thing straight. If you take a particle in a potential and study all of its paths through that potential, he sh Feynman showed a remarkable co correspondence between integrating where all the paths this particle can take uh, and that's proportional to the trace of e to the minus beta times some Hamiltonian. Now here, S is a classical thing. These are classical variables. Whereas the Hamiltonian involves quantum variables, and these quantum variables do not commute. And the amazing thing that these are equivalent. In fact, d-dimensional quantum mechanics is equivalent to a statistical mechanics problem in one more dimension. And this is really the heart of what we're doing in lattice gauge theory. Uh, what we call paths for ordinary quantum mechanics are what we call configurations of the lattice fields. And you actually, this is kind of a mathematically tricky thing to define, so we define it with a cutoff. We have to, let's do this back. There's a, we, we divide space into separate time slices, and then we have to take the distance between them and make them smaller and smaller. And in the process, it's kind of interesting because this uh, path looks kind of like a worm, or you might want to call it a string. <clears throat> but it turns out these paths typically are extremely wiggly. 
And in fact, you can show that it, as you try to define the path integral as this limit of vanishing lattice spacing, the typical paths are in fact not differentiable. And so the, the typical fields in the lattice simulation are not differentiable configurations. And that's really easy to show for the quantum mechanics case. And this will be important for some of the things I'll discuss later. Now, perturbation theory, of course, we take our action and we divide it into a, a, a part which describes free particle propagation and a part which just couples the fields together. And these generate the famous Feynman diagrams, which are all over Feynman's van. You get this beautiful picture. But the important thing to know is that the path integral is a more general formulation than doing perturbation theory. You don't have to do perturbation theory. Now this is also sort of true in electromagnetism too. Uh, years ago, Dyson, uh, well, first of all, the alpha is very, very tiny, so we know that perturbation theory works for all purposes. But Dyson showed that it could not converge. And he said if it converged, then things would be analytic in the charge. And so you could take E to IE, and it would make like charges attract each other instead of repelling. And that's not a very, well, that would be an interesting situation if we could actually do it. But you take a whole bunch of negative charges and pile them up somewhere, and a whole bunch of positive charges and pile them up somewhere else. And then you can pop a pair out of the vacuum if, you, if these charges are big enough. And you can get free energy. Every time you pop another pair out of the vacuum, you dump the things into these things, and you get, uh, uh, get energy. So the vacuum would be unstable. Well, this is a very old argument. Now, QCD is also, you can't really do in perturbation theory for uh, some other reasons. First of all, if you took uh, the coupling constant to zero, well, your spectrum would be free quarks and gluons. But when you turn it, not, as soon as you turn on the coupling constant, the, your spectrum completely changes in structure. You get protons and pions. It's just qualitatively different, so you can't, you can imagine doing any kind of perturbative expansion would be difficult. <clears throat> so we have to go beyond perturbation theory to see things like the confinement of the flux tubes connecting a quark and an antiquark into the strings, which I think uh, Frank alluded to, and I know uh, Lenny's going to talk about some later. Now, quantum field theories are, are notorious for having divergences. Uh, so we always have to introduce some kind of cutoff to do any kind of calculation. And we remove the cutoff by some limiting procedure where we adjust the couplings as we remove the cutoff to hold physical quantities fixed. So this is an old idea. Hmm. Most regulators are based on perturbation theory. You start calculating diagrams, you find something which diverges, and you cut it off. But QCD really requires a non-perturbative regulator. And that's what lattice ga gauge theory is. You should just think of the lattice spacing as a cutoff. So we're going to put our quarks and, and our gluons onto the lattice, and this, you can read about how to do it in lots of places. So you take, replace a smooth world line um, uh, with a bunch of hops on your lattice. And you've got a lattice spacing there which you want to remove at the end. So that's what lattice gauge theory is all about. So what, what do we want to hold fixed? Well, this is kind of a theoretical argument, but uh, what's more physical than the proton? We know its mass precisely. So uh, on our lattice, the proton is going to have a mass which will depend on the coupling constants you put in, and it will depend on the lattice spacing. And of course, you want to hold that constant. So you differentiate the proton mass with respect to the lattice spacing, and you better get zero. So this is just use a chain rule. Uh, now, the lattice spacing is the dimensional thing you're putting in here. So you, you, one of these terms you actually know, the derivative of the mat proton mass with the lattice spacing is just minus the proton mass. 
So from this, you can just rearrange things and discover that the way the coupling constant varies with your cutoff, which is called beta, and apparently I'm using the reverse sign from most of the rest of the world on this, but <laughs> uh, as Frank pointed out when I gave this talk earlier. Uh, but that is just the, how the proton varies in mass as you vary the coupling constant, and that's it. All right, so what's remarkable, and this is what Frank and David and uh, Pulitzer wrote down, was that they said you could expand this thing in a perturbative expansion, even though it's a non-perturbative thing we're after, you can do that. And they calculated the uh, coefficient, which is this known thing. NF here refers to the number of flavors in the theory. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, the next term in the series was found by Caswell and Jones. So this is ancient history, which is what we're celebrating here. Now, these two first coefficients are universal. It's easy to prove that they don't depend on what scheme you're using to cut the theory off. And so it applies to the lattice theory, too. And this is a pretty simple differential equation. You can sit there and a good high school student exercise to solve it. Uh, and you can discover how the lattice spacing depends on the coupling. Uh, and in the process of solving a differential equation, you pick up an integration constant. So lambda is some integration constant. And from this equation, you can see that as to get, to get a to go to zero, all you need to do is take the coupling constant to zero because of this exponential factor. As g goes to zero, this will go to zero, and so a will go to zero. That is the phenomenon of asymptotic freedom. Now, particle masses, all the physical, you know, like the proton mass has to be proportional to this integration constant. So you discover that the mass of the proton is proportional to this, and that's a, something you have to calculate, but it's proportional to this combination. This is non-perturbative, so you see that there's non-perturbative stuff going on. And this phenomenon of turning a coupling constant into a scale was given a marvelous name by Sidney Coleman. Coleman and Weinberg, and they called it dimensional transmutation. I think it's a very pretty name. Uh, so what has happened is that the renormalization procedure has eliminated a dimensional coupling, a dimensionless coupling constant from the theory and replaced it with an overall scale. Now, uh, I said the, the theory also depends on the quark masses. They also require renormalization, so I don't want to go about that into too much detail, except uh, it means you have to hold more things fixed. You have to hold the masses of the pions and the rows and everything fixed. And you can solve that equation, too. There's another parameter that comes in called gamma naught, which is 8 over 4 pi squared. Uh, and so the uh, particle, the, the quark, the parameters that go into your Lagrangian, you pick up another integration constant. Uh, and you get one integration constant for each, for each quark species. And the mass is proportional to the integration constant times the coupling constant to a certain power. Now this coupling constant is going to go to zero for the continuum limit, which means the bare mass also is going to go to the zero for the continuum limit. So to do the continuum limit of a lattice theory, you have to take both the coupling constant and the masses of the, the bare masses of the particles to zero in some well-defined way. Uh, now these, do, these integration constants depend a little bit on the details of how you define and what you're holding fixed and everything else, and they can get mixed together, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, but this is amazing. We now have a way to precisely define QCD. QCD is defined as this limit of the cutoff theory. 
This is something we don't have for the other interactions. We actually understand the strong interactions better than we understand electromagnetism and uh, the weak interactions. Because you can also put electroweak theory on the lattice. It turns out to be fine. You can even do it with the uh, chiral symmetry breaking, et cetera. But it has two, a couple differences. One, uh, the U1 theory, the U1 part of it, is not asymptotically free. What can you do about that? Well, I don't know. This is cause for speculation. You could maybe think of unification, which, and I personally like SO10 as a particular way to do it. But uh, that would be one way to get to, do, to find the theory. But then the Higgs is also a, plays a crucial role in this stuff. And a couple speculations here. If you could perhaps a composite Higgs. Perhaps some people have speculated on the top quark is very heavy, and so maybe there's some interplay with that. Another possibility is that it just tells you that to do the continuum limit, you have to take the Higgs self-couplings. They're going to have to go to zero in some complicated way. So that's not really understood. Now, this idea that uh, gauge theories have non-perturbative issues is also true even in the classical theory. And as well known, this is cl closely coupled with topology. The fact that I can t take a certain construction of f and that times f dual, and this is always an integer. Uh, this is always an integer for smooth fields. Now remember I told you at the beginning that the typical gauge configurations are not differentiable, so there's going to be some subtleties here, which will come in later. Now, the reason this classical issue is important comes about through something called the index theorem. That if you have non-zero winding, then the, you can show that the Dirac equation has modes where, where the Dirac operator opping on psi, which is this mess, vanishes on those modes. And you can also prove from the index theorem that these modes are chiral, that gamma 5 is either plus or minus 1 on them, depending upon which solution you're looking at. Uh, this index theorem says it's basically all the other eigenvalues than the ones which are these zero modes are in chiral pairs and they cancel out. Now why is this important? Uh, this was shown by Fujikawa, actually, and I think one of the most elegant ways to do it. He said, well, we know these configurations exist because we found solutions for them. Uh, on these particular solutions, the trace of gamma 5, which is the sum over all modes of the Dirac operator, uh, will be the winding number. All the other modes cancel out, so it's only these zero modes that matter. So therefore, if I take my quark fields and multiply them times a factor of e to the i gamma 5 times theta, that will not be a symmetry. Naively, you would think this is just a change of variables, which is nothing. But it's not just a change of variables. It changes the fermion measure by the determinant of the trace of the determinant of this matrix, which is e to the tr trace of gamma 5, and it's not 0. So basically what happens, if you have a configuration with some winding, and you try to do your path integral, you're going to find your configurations get weighted by an extra factor, e to the nu times this angle theta. It's a new theory. It's related to why the eta prime is not a sort of Goldstone boson. Uh, otherwise, this would be a symmetry which would have a Goldstone boson, but it's not. So it has a parameter which you don't see perturbatively. So for every value of this parameter theta, the perturbative expansion is identical. There's an interesting case of theta of pi. Theta of pi just takes all the masses and turns them to their negative. And you conclude that if I take like three flavor QCD, and just flip the signs of all the masses, I have a different theory. It's the theta of pi theory. It's just different. Uh, and this you can't see in perturbation theory, because the sign of the Fermion mass, you can drop out 
of any Feynman diagram just by doing one of these gamma phi rotations. Now, this brings up a very famous puzzle. If theta is not zero, the theory has to violate CP, and I'll come into that again later. Uh, and experimentally, theta is very small, and uh, I, I'm not sure Helen might be talking about this tonight. <laughs> I don't have an answer to why it's small, so I, I will skip on. So everything so far is pretty uh, motherhood and apple pie about QCD. I'm gonna get a little more nutty here. Quarks are confined. What does their mass mean? A real physical particle, like a proton, what you do is you make a beam of them, you calculate the energy the, to get the beam, and you take, you know, the energy starts off as the rest mass plus a half mb squared plus more and more stuff. And so this is a very well-defined thing for the proton. We know its mass. But quarks don't propagate alone. They always travel in bunches. Okay, I think I'm, yeah, I'm in good shape on time. Uh, so how do you define their masses? This turns out to be a somewhat subtle question uh, associated with the, those renormalization constants, the integration constants that come from solving the uh, renormalization group. Uh, and to see that there's a problem here, it's kind of nice, at least one way I like to see it, think of it, is in terms of the spectrum of particles. So let's look at the spectrum of some of the light things. And so let's look at the neutral pseudoscalars. There's the pi, which is some combination of u and u bar and d and d bar. And then there's the eta, which brings in some s strange quarks. And then there's the eta prime. And these are all different combinations. Uh, the first minus sign is because it's isospin one. This minus minus sign is because it's a pseudoscalar, etc. There's actually a fourth pseudoscalar which is involved in this, but I'm not going to bring in here. That's the fact that I can make a glue ball also in the pseudoscalar state, okay, KFF dual. But it's hidden here. So you see that all, all of these particles contain uh, up quarks. So, so therefore, I can create any of them with an up, up bar. So I can create it with an up, up bar, and then I can destroy it with a down, down bar. And this process involves a spin flip. Up quark switches to from left to right, down quark switches from left to right. And this will not vanish because these particles are not equal in mass. I mean, if, it, if the strange quark was as light as the light ones, then the pi and the eta would have the same mass. But the eta prime is heavier because of uh, anomaly issues. So there is a possible spin flip process via the chiral anomaly. And this is, in fact, what's sometimes called the Tuff vertex, because he pointed this out a long time ago. All right, supposing we now take and, and turn on a small down quark mass. And we do the same process of creating these mesons with that. You can always, if it's got a little mass, you can close it off and you discover you have a process which will, looks like a mass term for the up quark. So a non-vanishing down quark mass shifts the up quark mass. This means that all the quark masses and that integration constant lambda, and the integration constant lambda gets in there because the eta prime's in here, they all are a bit entangled, so it's a little tricky to separate them. And this has been pointed out many times by many people, I think most importantly by Tuff back in 76. Uh, and when you're doing a lattice simulation, you're integrating over everything. And so therefore, uh, it's automatically included there. Now, chiral symmetry actually gives you some more information. Uh, if your quarks are degenerate, 
you know there's this oops, uh, chiral symmetry result that the pi on mass is proportional to the quark mass. So that's pretty well established. And it's coming out of the simulations too. Uh, so massless quarks imply massless pions. And so the point where the mass quark, if you had a massless pion, you would know that the quark mass vanishes. So you would have it well defined. But it's interesting to think about isosin breaking, because interesting things can happen. Uh, now first, if the quark masses are both fairly light, the pion mass is just proportional to the average of the two. That's also an old result. But this has some interesting consequences. First of all, it says, I can make my up quark mass a little bit negative, and I'm still going to have, if MD is positive enough, I'm still going to have a nice sensible theory. So there's a mass gap at m mu equals 0 even if the down, if as long as the down quark mass is positive in mass. And you can have sensible physics there. Now, as I said before, perturbation theory, the sign of the mass is totally a convention. But that's not true non-perturbatively. And it raises an interesting puzzle because a negative quark mass is equivalent to this theta parameter being there. And it's easy to, it turns out it's easy to prove if the quarks were degenerate at theta of pi, oh, I just not, I'm just not holding this right. There we go. Uh, you can easily show that parity is spontaneously broken at theta of pi with degenerate quarks. And I'm not going to go into those details unless somebody insists. Uh, so something interesting must happen. Because if the up quark mass is a little bit negative, there's still a mass gap, nothing fancy happening. Pion's getting a little lighter. But if I take it all the way down to minus the, the uh, down quark mass, I've got to have parity breaking. So there must somewhere be a phase transition between the region with theta of pi and the region with, with the quark mass is very small. Something must go on. And what goes on is actually something which is called the Daschen phenomenon. Because uh, he showed a long time ago that, chiral, that uh, current algebra is consistent with possibly having parity violation. And so we can imagine, I guess the font's a little small, but uh, I'm going to be varying the up quark mass from a fixed down quark mass. So down quark mass is somewhere here. And so this is the isospin point. And, and there's this heavier thing, the eta prime, hanging around. Now, as soon as you leave the isospin point, uh, as you break the break isospin by making the up quark a little lighter, the, pi, the charge pi and the neutral pi can separate from each other. They're not necessarily the same mass anymore. And it's natural for the pi naught to uh, be the lighter one because it's mixing with the eta. And so what can happen is as you go down in mass, the pi on, neutral pion gets lighter and lighter and lighter. And before you get to the up quark mass being minus the down quark mass, the pion mass can vanish. Now once the neutral pion vanishes, it can condense. You have a negative mass scalar, just like in the Higgs mechanism. So once the pion mass, neutral pion mass goes negative, it's going to condense. This con condensation is going to give it an expectation value. CP will be broken because this is CP odd. This occurrently, formally occurs at theta of pi because the product of my quark masses is negative. And Dashen showed this was possible in current algebra before QCD was even written down, which is pretty amazing. So we discover, oh, and this is, you can see this in certain models, like the simple sigma model. It actually happens quite clearly. Uh, you can work out the way, the way the quark masses depend on the, the way the particle masses depend on the uh, 
support masses involve some kind of mixing matrix when they're not equal. Uh, and these formulas just show the pi on becomes massless when mu is a certain combination of m d and m s and d plus m s. Anyway, it's before you get to minus m d. It happens. Now, this is just a model, but uh, I think the qualitative arguments are pretty clean. So what you're going to have is some kind of a transition, and then the simplest picture is just an Ising-like transition. At some negative value of the quark mass, and the order parameter for this transition is the expectation value of the pion field, breaking its TP spontaneously. So if I manage, imagine varying my, here's my theory as a function of mu and md, and if I go down in mu, I'm going to hit this funny phase. Now, actually, there's a very recent paper where they've study this phenomenon in the two flavor Schwinger model and just, uh, it's just there. Uh, Coleman actually had a funny name for this weird phase in the Schwinger model. He called it the half asymptotic phase. I always thought it was kind of a cute name. Coleman is good for finding good names. Okay, so this is an interesting picture. And it ha has some interesting symmetries. First of all, I flip the sign. Uh, if I if I inter interchange the up and the down quarks, well, that's just isospin symmetry. So it's just what you, and I'm ignoring electromagnetism here. They just that complicates it, but it's still here. And there's another symmetry you see if I reflect the signs of both, pick up and the down quark mass to minus up and down quark mass. That's a flavored chiral symmetry, and that can be generated by a rotation of the field by a gamma five with an extra factor of tau three. And tau three is traceless, and so this actually is a symmetry. So that's fine. But the interesting message here if there is no symmetry, if I just flip one of the quark masses, if I take mu and md to minus mu and md, there's no symmetry there. And in perturbation theory, there would be. So this means that a non-perturbative, non-degenerate massless quark is not protected from any kind of renormalization by symmetries. That symmetry is broken. Which is interesting, because you know, symmetries normally tell you things like multiplicative mass renormalization. So that's true for the quark mass difference, because that's isospin symmetry. It's true for the quark mass average. But these two renormalizations, non-perturbatively, can be different. And that's this phenomenon that the up quark mass gets a, an additive mass shift from the down quark. And the details of this depend on the scheme that you're working with. How does this happen on the lattice? Well, on the lattice, we have to solve things like the Dubler problem and stuff, <coughs> which I'm not going into here. But uh, Wilson fermions actually have an automatic additive renormalization, which depends on the details of the coefficient of the Wilson term. So there is some additive renormalization in Wilson. That's true also in overlap fermions. They depend on the kernel you use to define them. And the usual kernel is the Wilson fermions again, so it depends on the same parameters. You don't see this with staggered fermions. And the reason is that staggered fermions always have a degeneracy between the various quarks. You cannot break the symmetry between the up and the down quark mass with uh, staggered fermions. And that just, this symmetry cancels the, this effect completely. I'm going to finish early as usual. Oh, well. Should we care if quark masses are fuzzy? Well, you don't measure the quark masses in, in scattering things. Uh, you measure the physical particles, the protons and the pions, and you know their masses precisely. And this is related to the fact that there's a fuzziness in gauge field topology. I said at the beginning, a typical lattice configuration is non-differentiable. 
And it's actually kind of interesting to see how the topology w works out on the last. It comes about because of eigenvalues in the complex plane colliding and becoming, you can get chiral eigenvalues, but they're just not at zero. Uh, so one important thing is that only the physical particle masses and their scatterings are physical. All right, so like I said, I finished early. Uh, Non-perturbative physics is crucial for understanding the physics of QCD. Asymptotic freedom and the lattice are a way of defining the theory. It's well defined as a limit of a lattice theory. Uh, the trouble with the full standard model is that QED and Higgs field don't have asymptotic freedom, so they're a bit more hard to, hard to figure out how to define them. Well, an interesting point is that there is another parameter in this thing. You can have different theories with identical perturbation expansions. And then the final point is that non-degenerate quark masses do depend on the details of your scheme. And the idea of a massless single quark is ill-defined if the other quarks are not massless. So uh, that's what I had to say. So, so thank you all. <laughs> okay, Mike, I, I have two questions. Well, it, it may, that may be too much, but let me ask the first one first. Um, you say there's no real invariant meaning to saying the up quark mass is zero, for example, if the down quark mass is not zero. Um, I vaguely remember that people used to think a solution to the theta problem was up quark mass was equal to zero. Okay, I am explicitly saying that is false. Good. The theta, you can, it, it's the real part of the quark mass which is ambiguous. If it has an imaginary part, then there's a theta problem. So uh, it's just being real doesn't mean anything special about m up equals zero. It's, it's, you can add an imaginary part. You can always add an imaginary part, and that is the problem. Yeah. Okay, good. I, I, I think that sorts something out for me. The other question is a more general question. When I was first thinking about trying to do some numerical work with lattice gauge theory, Ken Wilson said to me, I remember his words, beware the pion. Um, I asked him why, and he said the pion is smaller than other hadrons, and it's going to be much harder to get the mass of the pion to be light. Indeed, that was true, at least with my simulations. Was that generally true of lattice gauge, at least in the early days? Well, I think in the early true. days, that was one of the things they looked for. They looked at the pion mass as a function of the quark masses, yeah. and, and they argued that you could sort of see it getting smaller. Uh, it's not until recent years they've been able to bring it down to around its physical value, which requires enormous amounts of simulation. But yeah, it, it, it's tricky. And then the pion also gives you all this other interesting stuff on chiral symmetry, which is fantastic. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I'm asking, the reason I'm asking this is because it comes up in my own talk, and I wanted an expert to tell me, yeah, the pion is hard. Yes, it's so, certain, definitely hard. And it, it, we understand why it's hard. The, it's, the pion is light, and when it, things get very, very light, uh, you have long correlation lengths, and you have to, it's much harder to simulate things. You're getting nearer this chiral point, which has got a massless particle. That, I don't think, was what Wilson meant. I think he meant that the pion is physically smaller than other particles, and therefore it takes a smaller lattice spacing. I never understood why he thought that, but... Uh, well, you definitely want to have... I, I would say it differently. You have to have the lattice larger than the Compton wavelength of the pion, which is getting big. And so it's really, you need a big lattice to fit it on there. 
Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's always been a hard thing to get into chiral limit. Any more questions? Uh, right, oh, is it? Yeah. Sure. Oh, uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, about this phase diagram for the two flavor Schwinger model, which just so happens uh, I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. And I think you can see it very precisely in the Hamiltonian uh, lattice theory with staggered fermions actually uh, using some improvement term that, that I'll mention. But another point is I think along the diagonal you actually see dimensional transmutation and that you can even see in the continuum because... By diagonal you mean the equal mass? Yeah, yeah, the SU2 line at very small quark mass, uh, electron mass much smaller than G, you get uh, the gap which is exponentially small, like e to the minus G squared over M squared of oh. that order. And that has to do with the logarithmic flow in the sine gordon description that Coleman actually introduced. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I've always yeah, yeah, liked we, Coleman's we, point of view on this. It's, it's a, but there was something missing in his paper about precisely theta equal pi, because then the, the deformation term produced by the mass is a margin, nearly marginal operator, so you have to look at the sine Gordon flow. So it's actually this two-flavor model is a model of dimensional transmutation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the two flavor Schwinger model, there's uh, other interesting issues. When it's massless, you can solve it just as you can solve the one flavor. Uh, but this, the way the chiral symmetry works is very fascinating because we, we really want to get a full SU2 chiral symmetry, and which means that you've got. In, well, the current algebra is the issue. You, you've got to have the three currents. What are the three currents? And, and you can work it all out. It's, it's, a, it's a very pretty model uh, because it's solvable. Uh, but mm -hmm. that, that's another thing I've written about but didn't get into here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I look forward but to the, the yeah, talk this tomorrow. This will be in my talk, actually, the picture you showed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for, the, for, for, for your lecture. And uh, I'm just trying to comment about this uh, quark masses that I would say that in theory, which define like a latest theory or whatever, uh, the, the meaning of this masses is just your initial theoretical parameter in, in your, uh, uh, in, uh, 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 given at short distances, say, on the latest size, right? So in this way, it's your parameter, then you can discuss you know, how they related to observable quantity, you can discuss uh, running as function of distance, but eventually you can say that this initial parameter uh, related to, say, meson masses, say, pi and mass, k and mass, whatever. So, so in this sense, uh, I still kind of would not, did not follow, you know, that in this way, for example, the notion of imaginary part uh, does not appear in this, in this sense or, or for the masses. Uh, and what you said about influences masses to each other, it's like coupling constant. You have coupling constant in your original scheme, right? But the, the, end, the answer is uh, lambda, right? You have uh, parameter lambda. So for the masses, you would have uh, kind of analog approach, uh, and I would not see a kind of conceptual problem with this, okay? I, I guess I would say that once you've got your cutoff all defined and everything else, then the masses are well defined. But somebody else might use a different cutoff and they might get a different answer. So it, and it depends on what you're holding fixed, et cetera. But That's true, uh, and the same is true for coupling constant. You also can use- Absolutely, it depends on your scheme. That's right, and that's yeah, the whole yeah, point. Right, but but so at the, day, at the end of the day, we, we still have this kind of input theoretical parameters uh, and we are trying to relate them to something which is observable, right? So it's, I guess uh, what, what I'm actually talking about is something which so, the perturber people call the renormal on amb ambiguity. It's the same thing. That how you renormalize it can have 
No, this, this is okay because when all ambiguity is the, the, the statement that certain effect you should con consider non perturbatively. This is okay. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I'm trying to discuss this uh, conceptual part, right? Okay, I guess you know, my main point is with my answer to Lenny that M up equals zero doesn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, is that David? Yeah, I, I guess I don't quite agree with your answer to Lenny's question about whether the massless up quark solves the strong CP problem or not. It's true that you get additive mass for normalizations, but it's all in the far infrared because it's from um, non-perturbative physics. So if I told you I had a grain unified theory where M up was zero at 10 to the 15 Jev, um, the additive mass for normalization in a two flavor model would be proportional to MD star, which wouldn't change arg dead M and wouldn't change theta. So your CP violation would be tiny in that case. So it's true you have to specify a scale at which your up quark mass is zero, but because the running is so infrared, I think it's still fair to say that a massless up quark in the, in the UV does solve the strong CP. Well, I would say it a little bit different. Uh, when you get to very high energies where perhaps some renormalization, where some unification is going on, we know there's a big CP violation in uh, the weak interactions. So if there's any kind of unification, why doesn't that stay there? Well, I don't think it makes nice models because as you say, if you put CP violation in at the gut scale in order to feed into the weak interactions, typically they're massive complex mass particles you have to integrate out that just give you a big theta. So I'm not advocating of this as a solution, but I, I thought you um, <coughs> said it a little bit too strongly. There's, well, there's another way to say it. I mean, there's an infinite number of ways to say these things, but uh, you can add to the QCD to Lagrangian FF dual. F, yeah, it's an FF dual term. That's the conventional way. You could also add to the QCD Lagrangian a term proportional to the eta prime. It turns out those are equivalent. And this is all related to the fact there's only one theta, not a theta and a theta prime. <laughs> there's only one physical combination. And adding a, a, a theta, I mean, a eta prime to the Lagrangian, that's not quite the same thing as giving it. I mean, you could say it's giving the up quark a mass, but it's, uh, well, okay. This is another way to look at these things. Okay, any more uh, questions or comments? Okay, then uh, we're going to 